Well, good morning. I do want to, first off, uh, just say we're glad you're with us and maybe you're watching online this morning and uh, maybe you're not feeling well or, or staying away, but just let you know how much we do love you at home. Um, and we're just asking for God to move in your home even today. But as far as I know, I mentioned last Sunday and you don't want to live always looking backwards, but it's just something that has been on my heart all week long as to why God moved the way he did last week. And I believe it was because his people humbled themselves. We humbled ourselves and we asked God to, to consider our ways. And I know that's tough to say, but when we read in the book of Haggai last week, we know that's what he was challenging the Jewish people to do as they went back to, to get ready to build the kingdom, to rebuild the kingdom of God that had been destroyed. And then what we're gonna look at today was how they responded. We talked of it last week that we know opposition came, obstacles came in their obedience, and as a response, they were paralyzed. And I know that all of us have been through a life in 2020. You know, we all were excited about the beginning of 2020. And then we desired to go back to 2019. And for many of us, 2021 has started out about the same. Not necessarily wanting to go back to 2020, but still 2019. But the question is, is what we ask of you last week was to consider your ways. When opposition came in 2020, when obstacles came in 2020, the question that we ask was, did the opposition and obstacle of life, did it drive you to Christ or did it drive you away from him? It did one or the other. The circumstances of last year either pushed you to him or you tro chose to run away from him and the way that you responded revealed the new priorities that you had set in your life. Whether you meant it or not, whether you meant to get there or not. And you see, that was Israel's response. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back and listen because we, we set the stage of the book of Haggai of where we're gonna be the next several weeks. I had all intentions of finishing chapter one today, but we're not making it through verse seven. So we got a little while. I don't know how long we'll be here. But as you know, the children of Israel had been instructed to go back. They had been in bondage for 70 plus years and they were instructed to go back and rebuild the temple. They went back, they were obedient. God provided, which we're gonna look at that today. But in their obedience, opposition came, obstacles came and they responded in such a way that it paralyzed them and therefore the mission that God had called them to do, the Bible says ceased for 16 years and they stopped doing what God had asked them to do. And so as I was looking back and getting ready and praying and asking the Lord where we would go this week and in the book of Haggai, I began to pray and, and something that he brought to my attention was again the way that they responded after they had heard the instruction of God. But something that he revealed to me was that the way that they responded appears that they have forgotten who God is. That they have forgotten where God brought them from and where God was taking them to. And so to fully understand this journey, to fully understand what I'm talking about and to understand what God was speaking to me, we're actually not gonna be in Haggai for the first three-fourths of today's message. We're actually gonna flip back to the book of Ezra. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to flip on further back in the Old Testament to the book of Ezra. And what we're gonna be reading here is Again, reminding you of what we talked about last week. King Cyrus of Persia went back. He had heard from the Lord and God had instructed him to go and to tell the children of Israel of how they needed to consider their ways. And what we're gonna look at in Ezra chapter one, verses one through four is that actual decree. This is actually what he is going to speak to them and what we find out that he writes and delivers to them. So I want you to read with me in chapter one, verses one through four in the book of Ezra. It says, now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by mouth of Jeremiah, 
the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all of the kingdom and also he put it in writing saying, verse two, thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all of his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, who is the God who is in Jerusalem. Verse four, every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, what we're gonna look at in reference to these four verses is we're gonna look at God's work versus man's work. We're gonna look at God's role versus our role or, or the man's role. And so what we read is through King Cyrus, he has instructed them to go back home. They've been in bondage for 70 plus years in Babylon. They are now being freed and sent back to Jerusalem to rebuild the kingdom that had been destroyed, to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. Now, one thing that we've got to understand is we got to understand a little bit about this journey. I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail, but this journey was much bigger than me telling you to go back home. Okay, it's something a lot more complex than you going and getting in your vehicle and returning home the way that many of you will after service today. So one thing that we know or a few things we know about this journey is this journey was long. This journey was dangerous and this journey was gonna be expensive. Now keep in mind, they've been away from home for 70 plus years and they're being told to go back there. So the place that they are going back to, many of them did not have an established home. So they were going back to nothing. They were just going back to what used to be home. Now Marie, keep in mind, they've been instructed to rebuild a temple. But what we find and what we read is that when they left, many of them left with nothing to rebuild the temple with. In many cases, they were obedient and they left with nothing. But then lastly, we see that along this journey, they were gonna face enemies. They were gonna face lands that were in possessions of other empires. So needless to say, this journey back home to rebuild the temple, they got all the odds stacked against them. They've got all the odds, all the adversity. They've got all the opposition that's awaiting them in their obedience. But that's what I love to watch God do. When God leads us to do things that seem like an impossibility, this is an opportunity for him to prove how God he is. Hey. And so when something is said, something is spoken of the Lord and it seems like an impossibility, Buckle your seatbelt because God is about to prove who he really is. And so that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see his work versus our work. And when I was reading through this, I, I noticed a pattern. And I thought back and I compared even through my life, I begin to see this, this very same pattern take place. And it's almost like this equation of God. And what I mean by that is that when we are listening to the voice of God, when we're asking God to lead us, when we're asking God to direct us, and then he finally speaks. He gives us the direction of what he wants us to do, what he's called us to do. And then the next part of that equation is we as his followers are to step out on faith to step out onto what we can't see, step out into what we don't know the outcomes are gonna become. But here's what is the beauty of God. He speaks, we step out, then he provides. I don't know about you, but if God would listen to me, there's a lot easier way to do that. It would be a whole lot easier if God would speak, God would provide, now I can step out. Wouldn't that, would y'all all agree or y'all a lot more spiritual than I am? Come on, 
There's a whole lot of times in my life I can look back and say, God, if I've heard you speak, if you would have provided, it would have been a whole lot easier to take a step of faith. But you see, when we do that, when we're expectant of that to God to do that, we're missing the opportunity for him to show who he is. When he speaks, we're called to step out on faith. And then he proves just how God he is. And so that's what we see in verse four of Ezra chapter one. It says, for every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, and together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So one thing that we have to understand is when he told them to return home, they didn't all return to the heart of the city. They returned to their home and in many cases, it was on the outskirts of the city. It was in Judah, it was in the surrounding area. But the beauty of that is God was sending people exactly where he wanted them to go because what we just read in verse four is that every place that God sent a man to go back to, we saw that the men of that place would provide everything that they needed. You see, they stepped out on faith with nothing, but along the journey is where God would provide what was needed to build the temple. Because we read there, it said, let the men of that place support him. And so for us as a follower of Christ in this day and age, what we are called to do is when God speaks, we're to step out. And in most cases, we're to step out with nothing so that he can prove he's everything so that he can prove who he is. And as a church family, what I want us to wrap our mind around as we move forward in the year 2021, when God speaks, we as a body are going to move. Did you hear me? In 2021, when God speaks to this congregation, to my heart, to this team's heart, We are going to move. And guess what? On paper, it may not make sense. There may not be a line item for it. There may not be a dollar amount for it. But I'm here to tell you right now, when God speaks, we will step out. And when we step out, we will watch him provide. And so now you have to hold me accountable. So when he speaks, we gotta move. And that's what we saw is all along this journey. In many cases, they left the bondage of Babylon with nothing. They stepped out on faith. And along the journey, he provided everything. He provided all of the manpower He provided all of the supplies. He provided all of the finances. He provided every last detail for them to accomplish what God had instructed them to do. And so there's no doubt in my mind the God that I serve has not changed. If God calls us, he is going to provide every last detail. He's gonna provide all of the manpower. He's gonna provide all the resources. He's gonna supply all of the need. He's gonna give us everything that we need to fulfill what he's called us to do. But here's what I want you to listen to right now. If God has called you here, If God has called you to make Chestnut Mountain Church your home, you are part of the detail. You are part of the manpower. You are part of the resource. You are part of the supplies. And I was trying to think of a 
smooth way to get my membership plug here, but we're just going to call it what it is. On February 7th, if God's been moving in your heart to, for you to call this place home, We'll be having a membership class immediately following service where we'll provide lunch. You'll hear everything about, if you don't already know, of what God's doing here and who he's called us to be. And so you can go online. There's many that have already signed up to be a part of that, that membership class on February 7th. So if that's you, I would invite you to do that. But if God is prompting your heart to do that, I wanna share with you that you are part of the detail for him to fulfill the vision of this church. God didn't save you so that you could stay seated. God saved you so that you can serve the kingdom of God. And if he's called you here, you're part of that detail. You say, well, Brian, man, that's not really for me. I just kind of like going to church and checking it off my list and getting on about my week. If that's your idea of what God has called us to be here, I'll just go ahead and tell you, this is probably not the church for you. If God's called you here, he's called you here to fill his vision, his mission of us saturating the world with the good news. And you can't do that sitting in these comfortable chairs. So if you're here, God's called you. God wants you to be part of the detail. I want you to be part of the detail. You are part of the detail. But here's how this thing kind of plays out. As soon as the Holy Spirit of God speaks and reveals that to you, that you're part of the detail, that you're part of the team, that you're part of the vision and the mission that God has called us to do, you know what the enemy does? He tells you the exact opposite. His favorite word is can't. He tells you, you can't do this. You can't do that. You don't have this. You don't have that. And so all along this journey of being obedient to the Lord, let me go ahead and tell you, you're gonna battle every fear and every insecurity that is known to man. But he's called you higher. If he calls you, he's gonna provide. Think about the Jewish people. They've just been told to go back and to build the temple of God, to rebuild this thing that has been lying in ruins and that has been destroyed. The first excuse for many of them was probably, go build a temple. I can't drive a nail. I don't know anything about building anything. And so for many of you, when you hear that God has called you here to build the kingdom, you're sitting there going, I can't do that. I'm not qualified to do that. Nobody knows my past here. If they find out about my past, they'll tell me to get out of a dodge, to get gone. You know, your past is probably the very thing that God wants to use to build the kingdom. Hey. Has God given you a story? Has God given you the ability to teach? Has God given you the financial means to be a supporter and to be an investor in this ministry? But what I do know about God is if he's placed you here, you have a place here. You have a job here. You have a responsibility here. And what we read in Ezra is we see that there was a place for everyone. In Ezra chapter three, verse seven, we see that, that you see that some gave money to the masons and the carpenters. So we see that some had the financial means, some had masonry skills and some had carpentry skills. So already we see three things that people could do. In chapter two, verse 68, it said that some gave a free will offering. When we study that, we find out that that is all the supplies that were needed to build the temple. Again, it was about somebody being open-handed with what material things that God had given them. 
And then in chapter two, verse 70, we would like to think this is when the temple was up and functioning that it says that some were singers, some were gatekeepers, and some were temple servants. There's a place for everyone. If God has called you here, he has a place for you. He has a calling for you. But along the journey in many cases is when God reveals that to us. Along the journey is when God reveals that to us. But what's missing is that first step of faith. That stepping into the unknown. But the question is, is when we step and he begins to reveal what talents he's given us that he wants you to give back, when he reveals and what supplies that he's given you that he wants you to let go of to build the kingdom, maybe it's finances, whatever it may be that God has given you, once he reveals that, then it is your responsibility to do with it what God intended to be done with it. Now, we gotta ask the question, are you using what God has given you to build his kingdom? When we look at the Jewish people here, we see that that's not the case in what they were doing. I want you to flip to Haggai chapter one. Haggai chapter one, and we're gonna see exactly what they did with what God provided. And this is gonna kind of tie all this in together about they forgot who God was. Because if you remember, God spoke, they stepped out on faith, and he supplied. So you can look at that and you can see that God's hand was all over it. God was moving. And then when opposition came, when obstacles came, they became discouraged. Now remember, they had all this high energy. They were excited about being obedient. They were seeing victories. And then all of a sudden, things got a little bit rocky. And it said that it paralyzed them and they stopped working on what God had called them to do for 16 years. It lied desolate. How quickly they forgot who God was how quickly they forgot just how God he was. And we see that in their response. Look with me in verses three and four of chapter one. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Is it time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate. What we see here is it's almost like a kid that gets caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Remember, they're supposed to be doing the work of the kingdom. They've been provided all the resources. They've been provided all the supplies of everything they've been called to do. They've been given it. But what we find out is it says in Haggai, he says, wait a minute. You're living in your paneled houses while the kingdom lies desolate, while the kingdom lies in ruins. And you know, for a, a North Hall boy like myself, when I heard paneled houses, I thought, you remember the old wood panel? You know, that stuff was about that thin and boy, it looked nice. <laughs> Our whole upstairs used to be paneling. And so when I thought about that, I thought, man, okay, I they got paneled houses, so what? But when you look into the context, when you study about a paneled house, what we find out is the paneling that was used for these houses was the wood that was meant for only temples and palaces for the king to live in. Did you hear what I just said? What was given to them was meant only for kings, for royalty to live in. 
The supplies that they were given were meant to build the kingdom of God. But you see what had happened that they had taken the very supplies that God had given them. They had taken all of the talent. They had taken all the resources. They had taken all the finances that God had provided. And when opposition came, when times got tough, they took their eyes off what God had called them to do and they stopped building his kingdom and they turned inward and they used the very things that God had supplied to build their own. They took all of those talents that God had given them to make their name famous. They took all of those resources to make their name famous. Because you see their priorities changed. Opposition caused a response. And that response was that God was no longer sitting on the throne of their heart. The one that was sitting on the throne of their heart was themselves. And for many of us, myself included in 2020, when opposition came, when obstacles came, it was very easy for us to get distracted and take our eyes off the calling that God had placed on our lives. And what happened is we turned internal and we became so focused on our own homes, on our own families that we lost sight of what God had called us to do. And the way that we responded is we took the very resources that he gave us to build his kingdom and we attempted to use them to build our own. So the question is this morning, is what has God given you that he's expectant of you to use in the building of his kingdom. But what are you holding on to? What have you not let go of that God has given you to build his kingdom? Because you do know every good gift, everything that you have is from him. And we don't give it back we're robbing from God. We are taking what is his. But then he drops the bomb and he says, hey, consider your ways. Look at verse five and six. Verse five and six we read, it says, now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink and there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. If you're using what God has given you for anything other than building his kingdom, you will not be satisfied. Because you see, what Christ exemplified for us on the cross is that in order for him to fulfill the calling that God had given him, he poured out everything. He poured out his blood, he poured out his life, And so what we can take from that example is the only way that we as a follower of Christ, the only way we will be satisfied is when we are pouring out what he's given us to do. When we are letting go of the very things that God has blessed us with, it's the only way we will find joy. It's the only way we will find peace. It's the only way we will find satisfaction because if we're using it to build our kingdom, I wanna go ahead and tell you, it'll never be enough. It will never be enough be enough.
So what has God given you that you're using to build your own kingdom? And I'm not talking necessarily, it's not always, I know you're thinking, man, he's gonna make me take out my wallet and dump everything I got. No, the only thing I ask you to pour out to God is your heart. I'm letting him do the rest. When you surrender your heart, then he will speak what he's given you. He will show you what he's given you. I know for me, the one thing that I tend to cling to a lot of times that I know God has given me to build his kingdom, you know what it is? It's my kids. Because you see, as a high school and college athlete, all I ever wanted to do was be the best athlete I could be. And so when I was 18 years old, when I was 25 years old, when I thought about having kids, I was like, man, my kid's gonna be the best athletes under the sun. God's got a sense of humor. My kids are athletes, but they don't really care to play anything. And to be honest, that was tough. But I'm riding down the road yesterday and Cooper was sitting in the passenger seat of my truck and he, his phone goes off and it was an alarm, which I found weird because he doesn't even have service. Like he doesn't even have a, a plan yet. And I'm like, I said, Cooper, what was that? He said, it was my alarm. I said, alarm for what? Because I got to read a verse in Haggai right now. Wow. My little Cooper pulled up his phone and, and he started reading verses. And I said, God, he's yours. He's yours. If he never plays soccer again, God, I'm okay with that because you've given me them to build your kingdom, not mine. So I wonder how many parents here this morning, how many of us are calling, or how many of us is God calling to lay our children on the altar? Say, God, do with my child what you want. Do with my child what you want to build your kingdom, no matter what our aspirations were, no matter what our dreams were, because God didn't give them to us to build our kingdom. He gave them to us to build his. So what has God given you that he's wanting you to build his kingdom? What do you need to let go of today? Is it a talent? Is it a story? Has God given you a story that he wants you to let go of? Has God given you finances that he wants you to let go of? Because I'm begging God with everything in me that he calls you to do things in 2021 that are gonna make you very uncomfortable. Because what I know about God is if you will be obedient and you will step out on what you can't see, get ready because he's about to prove how God he is. And then when we face the next battle, guess what? It's a little easier to step out because God has shown us who he is. And then when he calls us to something even greater, whew, then he proves again how God he is. But the question is, are we sitting on what God has given us and we're doing nothing with it? You know, I wanna brag on your obedience in 2020. I wanna brag on you listening to the voice of God and doing what he instructed 
stepping out on what you couldn't see. But oh, how sweet it is as a church family, we got to watch him be God. You see, at Christmas time, there were this idea of, of Sin Sunday. We're gonna go out into our community and we're gonna give some kids some Christmas presents. And I'm thinking, man, when Sam mentioned that to us, when we talked about it and the Lord kind of laid it in our lap, I thought, man, you know, 150 kids, we can handle that. If nobody in the church does everything, we've got enough in the missions budget, we can take care of it. And then when I saw it come across my desk that we had 350 kids to provide Christmas for, I went, uh-oh, that one ain't in the budget. But guess what? On Sin Sunday, we had more than enough because of your faithfulness. And I get to hear the stories. And I hate that you don't get to hear them all the time. I do. I got to hear the stories of these third and fourth grade students that were coming up to their teachers who go to church here and saying, hey, tell your church thank you for my Christmas present. That's the only Christmas present I've ever gotten. I remember my kids, I got frustrated with them at Christmas because they wouldn't make up their mind what they wanted. But here's little children who were saying, it's the first time I've ever got a Christmas present. That was because of your obedience. That's because you went into the community, you loved them. You purchased those gifts. And then at the end of October, we begin to talk about how God has used this little church on this corner for a couple hundred years to be a light into this community. And we talked about how God has continued to bless with this building, with this facility. He's given this to us because it's His and He wants us to use it for His glory. And so Tim came up and he shared and he challenged you. He challenged me to give up a Taco Bell meal a week to make an investment. If you remember, he asked us as a church family to, to examine and say, hey, can you give $25 a week to this facility? You say, well, you're giving it to the facility. That sounds kind of selfish. You see, we have a commitment to the bank for $3.8 million. Do the math. That's a lot of money every month. Can you imagine the lives that could be changed with that amount of money a month? No would not even be in our vocabulary. But because you responded since the first week of November till now, you as a church have given over $40,000 in a little over two months just to the building. You keep being obedient, it's gone. It's gone. I know the 3.8 million to me and you, it's like, oh, that's a lot of money. God laughs at $3.8 million. You say, well, Brian, you're making this about a dollar sign. No, I'm not. I'm making it about the condition of your heart. Are you willing to be surrendered in whatever area it is that he calls you to be obedient in? Do you need to surrender your kids? Do you need to surrender your skills? Do you need to surrender your family? Do you need to surrender your finances and say, God, okay, you've given me this, but I know now the reason you've given me this is because you want me to build your kingdom, not my own. And so I'm asking you this morning, again, let's consider our ways. Because when God speaks in 2021, we're gonna move. We're gonna be obedient. But you realize that you are part of the detail to fulfill what he calls us to do. So it takes all of us to be obedient. 
It takes all of us to be surrendered. And so when I ask you this morning to consider your ways, to consider your ways and ask God, God, reveal to me what you've given me that I'm holding entirely too tight to. God, what do I need to let go of this morning? And then I want you to ask him, God, reveal it. He's gonna speak. It requires you to step out. And then I want you to watch him provide. Watch him provide. God, I pray that right now is you were speaking to the hearts all in this room. God, I pray that as you speak, that we would follow that voice. And God, as you are speaking, the enemy is whispering, you can't, you can't. And God, I ask you with all the power in you to shut his mouth. Speak louder, speak stronger. But God, in that, make us weaker so that we become more dependent on you. So God, we thank you for speaking right now. And God, we ask all of this in your name, amen.